Hey there internets, I'm Michael and this is Two Can Play That Game, bringing you our review of Mage Knight the board game. So what is Mage Knight the board game? Well let's look at the cover here. Uh, we've, it's about Mage Knights, so presumably this guy here is the Mage Knight, and some other people floating around in an orange cloud. So it's a game about floating in orange clouds. Wait, what? No, 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 no. What Mage Knight is, is a fantasy adventure exploration game. So what you're doing is exploring the world, revealing new tiles and new creatures to fight and battle in an attempt to be the best Mage Knight you can be. Um, so you're fighting creatures to gain fame, and the more famous you are, the better you are, apparently. So... The way the game works is that you proceed along using your cards to move, fight and build up influence to gain additional followers and training in new areas and as the game progresses you will learn new things and this is represented by levelling up and you can either from levelling up be able to have more followers but you'll also be able to gain new skills gain new cards into your deck that represent new abilities that you have learned. So there is a deck building aspect to this game. If you're not too sure what I'm really going on about here, then it might help if we do a brief summary of how the game actually works, taking a look at the actual components. So let's take it to the table for a look at Mage Knight. First thing you're going to need to do when setting up to play the game is get your rule book here and flip towards the back and you'll find a scenario list. So you'll need to pick your scenario that you're going to play. The recommended starting one is this first reconnaissance here but there is a big list of different ones you can play with different kind of types of play if you will so you've got these conquest ones you've got cooperative ones where you're all working together and you've got semi-co-op and you've got competitive ones such as this dungeon lords one here where you're trying to kill off the other players and just be the last one standing for example like in one to return so once you pick your scenario, that'll give you some tips on how you're setting up your game. It'll also tell you any additional special rules that you have to have for setting out. But either way, you're going to need your spare mana dice here, your spare mana crystals, all in the centre here, available for everyone. You'll need to set up your fame and reputation board here. So unless stated otherwise, you'll start on zero fame on the fame track and zero reputation, which is actually the middle because it goes positive or minuses. Also, you'll want all your tokens ready, which represent the various monsters that you'll have to fight off, etc. Then to the left here, we have our advanced actions offering. So these are cards that we'll be buying throughout the game when we level up, etc. to improve our deck and make us better. And this is just the pile that this offering gets drawn from. Down here, we have the day board and night board with our available mana dice that we can use on there. And the mana dice are used to trigger various effects on cards. Now, the day board here tells us the spaces that each type of terrain costs to enter during the day phase. So you can't enter water or mountains, that's why they've got the X. And the other side of this board is the night side. So you do a day round and then a night round and alternate like that. And it changes what some of these things cost, mainly forests and deserts. So forests are cheaper during the day and more expensive at night and deserts are the other way round. Then to the left of that we have our player tokens here which is for tracking turn order. As it's the day round to the right of this we've got the unused nighttime tactics here. And then here we have our spell offering. So as well as advanced actions being able to be added to our deck and improve our deck 
throughout the game, we'll also be able to get advanced spells, which is just a different type of card that works in a slightly different way. Off to the side here we have our wounds deck, so whenever you get hurt in this game you take wound cards into your hand or deck, clogging it up and just meaning you can't get the cards you need. Also we have our artifacts deck, so this is another type of card much like we have the advanced actions and the spell offering. We have artifacts, so these are other cards that you can get through various effects during the game that will result in improving your deck. Here we have our spare terrain tiles, so this is our pool of terrain that we'll be working through as we explore the world, and the way this will work is you'll t draw the top tile off each time and eventually we'll work for all these littler countryside ones and reach these brown ones which are our core tiles and these represent an increase in difficulty in the terrain and the monsters that you'll face on it. So then here we have our unit decks so we've got our advanced units here and these will only come out once we reach those brown tiles and we have our basic unit deck. And then here we have our unit offerings. So these are the units that we can actually recruit at the moment. So for example, we have here the herbalists. And here we have our player area. So we've got here his skill tokens that we'll draw from when we do the skill level ups. And these will give you an option to pick a new special ability that will make your character unique and more powerful. Here we have our tokens that you're just going to be using to mark things on the board as you complete them. Here is a summary cheat sheet of the skills for this character and each character has their own card. Here we have the character card itself and this is where you'll be storing your crystals when you get those they'll just sit in this space here. And these tokens here, whichever one is visible, that tells you the stats for your character. So it also at the bottom here, you can see on this one here, we've got level 1 and 2. So this will be applying as long as you are level 1 or 2 on the fame track. And it means that you have 2 points of armour and a hand size of 5. As you level up, you'll remove these tokens and they give you extra command slots. These are command tokens, and that means that you can recruit people underneath them. So for each token you have revealed, you can recruit one more person. So at the beginning of the game, you'll only have the one. And as you reveal these, you can see your armor might get better, or you might even increase your hand limit, which will mean you'll have more cards available to help you defeat the challenges you face each turn. Then face down here we have our deck that we'll be drawing cards from each turn in order to try and face the various challenges. And then here we have our hand of five cards that we can use to then do various things. And the final thing we have set up here is we have our daytime tactics. So the first decision you'll be probably making in the game is which tactic to go for. These tactics are a very interesting part of the game. The number on them represents your turn order. So if you have the number one, you'll be first in turn. But then as you go up in the numbers, you have more powerful and interesting powers. So you can be slower to start, but gain power for doing so. So the aim of each game session might be slightly different depending on the scenario that you are actually playing, or at the very least the end condition of the scenario will be. But more often than not, you're trying to have the most fame. So you're trying to get as far down this track as you possibly can by the end of the game. And as well as getting down there being your points, it is also how you level up. So each time you go onto a new line, you have leveled up. Now, there are two different types of level up. There are the ones where you simply turn over one of your command tokens, so you gain a new unit slot, 
as well as improving your armour or hand size, which are represented by these hexagons here. So when you go to level 3, you then do that. The other type you have here are represented by a card and a skill. So when you go to level 2, for example, you will gain a new advanced action from the available ones into your deck to make you stronger. And as well as that, you'll pick from available skills, so you'll gain a new skill that will make you stronger. So how do you gain the fame then in order to win the game? Well, it's all about exploring this map here. And as you get to the end, you would simply add new ones on by doing an explore action that requires two points of movement. So the way you will move around this board and then fight the various creatures. So for example, here we have an orc, which if you fight and beat will give you four fame as denoted in this little banner at the bottom of the token here. If we look at this mage tower here, which is currently hidden, you can see you could get five fame for defeating that. You'll also get fame at the end of the game for achieving various things, such as gaining cards, gaining crystals, and defeating various obstacles, such as defeating mage towers, defeating keeps, and also exploring and defeating various monster locations. So there are a lot of different ways you're building up your fame. But as I say, the main thing you'll be doing is moving around and then fighting. So how does that work? Well, you have your hand of cards, and on each of these cards, it will have what that card does. So for example, at the top here, you can see Rage does attack or block two. So you could use this to do two attack on a creature or block a creature attacking you. Then it has this red mana symbol. What that means is you could use a mana die with the red symbol on in order to gain the benefit of the stronger power on this card rather than simply using the first one. But you can only use one mana die each turn. So instead of getting attack two, you get attack four, for example, on this card. Now, the cards do various different things, but the main things they'll be doing is attacking, blocking or moving. So you can see here we have move to. So you'll use these cards to also move around the map in order to explore it. As I said before, the costs of the various terrain types are listed on your night and day board. So for example, if I wanted to move this knight here into this grassy plain, I could use this stamina card that will give me a move of two and play it there in order to move two spaces into this grassy plane. Because a grassy plane during the daytime costs two movement points. This would then put me next to this orc here. So I could fight this orc, which would mean I would need attack cards. Now, the health of the orc is given here with its armor value. So it has armor four. So that's how much damage I would need to do to it to kill it. Its attack value would be listed here. So for example, if we look at this orc here, you can see it has an attack of three. Now this one gives a brown token. So what we would have to do is draw one of our brown tokens and that would dictate the attack value for this monster. However, we don't do that until the point of attack. So if you fail to defeat this monster, its attack value could change. So if we looked at my hand here, now I would need to do four attack. So I have two attack on this card here, so that would give me two, but then I don't have any more attack. Now, the available mana dice is a blue, a white, and a sun. So this gold one can represent anything. So I could use that to get my attack four. But 
he gets to attack me first because it's not ranged attack. So we get a Minotaur which has an attack value of 5. So this Orc's attack value is 5. Which would mean I would need to have block of 5 in order to avoid taking any wounds. Now if we look at the cards I have here, I have none with block values. But what you are able to do in this game is use any card sideways as one of anything else. So you could use it as one move, one block, or one attack, or there is also influence, which I'll talk about shortly. So I could play all three cards left in my hand as block, but that would only be three blocks, so there's no point me doing that. So I would take the wounds and then be able to kill the creature. Now, if I didn't want to take the wounds, rather than using this card to attack, I could have used it to give me two block. And then the other three cards would give me a total of five block, which would have blocked the attack of this orc, but then I'd have no cards left to attack and kill the orc itself, but I'd be able to try again on my next turn. So let's now talk about that other main action that I mentioned, which was influence. So let's imagine a map like this where we have a village here that we'd be able to go to and spend influence because in a village you can spend influence to recruit units. So I have a starting hand of cards like this which has some movement, some attack, some influence, some more movement. So I need to get to the village first which means I need to move over two grassy fields. So that's going to cost four points of movement. So I can play this swiftness card which gives movement two and this march card that gives move two to reach that village. Now what units you can recruit at different locations is represented by the symbols on the unit and the units have a cost represented by this number at the top left here which is the influence amount and then at the bottom they have their abilities. So let's say I want to buy the most expensive one here, this Utum Guardsman, which costs five. I now need to get five influence from the cards in my hand. But even if I played these two sideways, that would only give me two influence and then two influence from this promise card. But what I can do is play those sideways and then play this along with a white mana die to get influence four. So that would then mean I have six influence, which is enough to buy the Artem Guardsman. But that's a brief summary of what you will do on a turn in Mage Knight. You'll look at the cards in your hand, you'll decide what you want to do, and you'll be looking at those cards, whether you'll be using them sideways, using the basic power, or using the advanced power in order to achieve the goal that you want to achieve. As you level up, you'll gain better cards. And you'll also face bigger challenges. So that's a very brief summary of what Mage Knight is. Now, there is a lot more depth there with regards to the rules, which I'm not really gonna go into in this video, so there's just not time. But there are plenty of videos out there where you can find all of that detail. So, what do I think of Mage Knight? Well, let's start where I like to start, and that is the artwork. So, the box here really drew me in. Um, I mean, it doesn't really tell you anything about the game, but just this fantasy artwork, the style of the artwork, it's all very ooh to me. And it might appeal to you, it might not. Now, how that artwork carries on throughout the game, it's not necessarily the same style as that, but I think it's quite nice artwork. So, I mean, just on the day-night board here, you've got the same picture, day and night, it's an okay, nice picture. There's nothing offensive about the artwork in this game. And throughout all the cards, you've got the same sort of style of artwork with lots of different images. It's all very pleasing. It's fine. You know, it's not artwork that makes me go, wow, that is gorgeous, like some games. But it's not offensive. It's pleasing. It's fine. 
And I would say that carries on throughout the whole thing. Now, one thing I would say about artwork is the landscape tiles are a bit boring, but it's kind of understandable because it simply is just repeated hexagons of terrain with the odd little bit added. Now, they've done a nice thing where there is blurring between those terrains, etc. But yeah, it, they're not exciting, then they're, they're not thrilling. And that kind of applies for the majority of the artwork in this game. Let's move all along from artwork and onto components. Now, the quality of the components in this game are kind of variable, really. I mean, let's start with the miniatures you get. Now, these are nice, they're okay, they come pre-painted. There are definitely much better miniatures out there, but you're not buying this to be a miniatures game for the most part. Then of course, let's talk about all the cardboard pieces. So you've got the boards. These are good quality cardboard. They're not that thick, but they're sturdy, despite the thinness of them. And they're high quality, lasting really well. And the same even goes for like these boards here for your fame track and the day night. They are actually boards. Now, a lot of the time this would be very thin, flimsy cardboard in many games. That's not the case here. It is good, high quality. And all the tokens are the same level of cardboard. It is all very thick, all very sturdy and lasting really well. So we have here some of the round monster tokens, for example. Again, as I say, it's the same cardboard and it is good all round high quality. Now, the mana dice that you get, these... They're small dice and there's something, I think it's maybe just the unusualness of the size of dice makes the size of these really pleasing. It's an odd choice of colour with the grey etc. But the actual etching and colouring in of the colours is nice, it's vivid and it's lasting really well. I would say these are good quality dice. So what haven't I covered? Well, there's a lot of cards in this game. Now, the quality of these cards is actually really nice linen finish. These have had loads of hand. I really do enjoy playing it, so I play it as often as I can, which, okay, might not be as much as some games, but it does get a fair amount of play, and the cards get shuffled a lot, etc. Because it has got that deck building aspect, you are going through your deck and needing to shuffle it throughout the game. But the cards last really well, they're not warping, they're not bending, they're not fading, they're not peeling. These are good, high quality components. So, obviously I said the component quality was quite variable and I did mention about the miniatures not being necessarily great. Well, everything else I've said really good things about. So what isn't great? Well, you might disagree with me, but it's these mana token crystals here. Now, these are actually really nice with regards to the quality of plastic and with regards to the sculpting on that plastic. Although, you know how painful it is to stand on Lego barefoot? These are worse because these are spiky Lego. Do not stand on these, you will regret it, trust me. <laughs> um, so yeah, but the issue I have with them is the colours. They're just so faded and dull. Like this green is this this dull green. I mean, you compare it to the green on the dice and they're meant to be comparable and this is just dull. And I think it's where they've tried to do that see-throughness. I would have liked to have seen these come out and be more vivid and nicer looking. Um, so that's kind of a shame, but otherwise they're not bad. So that's probably enough going on about how nice the components are. And obviously there's loads of components I've not shown you. There's lots of different decks of cards, loads of tokens, etc. You are getting a lot in this box. Now, the final thing I am gonna mention about components before I move on is with regards to the rule book. Now, I say rule book, there's actually two rule books and the reason for this is they did one which you use as your starting guide that you just follow through. And then you have your main rule book. But the problem is 
there's some bits that are in this walkthrough that aren't in the main rule book and there's some bits you actually kind of need to know for the walkthrough that are in the main rule book and it's just all so clumsy and hard to find things and difficult to read there is a reason that people struggle to learn and get into mage knight and it is these rule books and i think they could have done a much nicer job they really needed to improve those and it's probably what lets the game down most is those rule books so before i go on to mechanisms let's talk about inserts so it's not really a game component but it's something i like to mention especially when it has a nice functional one so this one is actually kind of modular so all your tokens and everything you can kind of pull out and have on the table in this holder and then it can just go back in the box all your miniatures slot nicely into this vacuum form plastic you know you can see it holds them in so this is all actually really nice and practical now there's not really enough space for the cards to house easily if you learn how to take them in and put them out again you can do it but it feels like that is the letdown on this, that the cards aren't separated and stored better. Otherwise, a good insert. So, mechanics. Well, this game is fantastic mechanically. I really do love it. The thing that holds it back from being played more, though, is that there is so much thought and so much consideration taken on each turn that a game of this takes a long, long time. And that means that you need a whole day to play it. It is an epic experience and a really, really rewarding experience to play this. But because of the way all of those mechanisms give you so many choices and so much available to you, it does take a long time. So let's talk a bit about the various mechanisms. So one thing that is very... Uh, how do I put this? Very nice, I guess I'll just say, is these command tokens and levelling up. The way you simply remove one and you get your new stats and it also acts to give you a slot is really elegant and that is the word I was looking for. So yeah, that is a really elegant mechanism and works so nicely. Also, the way that the mana dice introduce a little element of luck, as well as having your cards draw coming out introducing luck, works very nicely. It, As you probably know, I like games that balance luck to strategy. And more than any game, this has a perfect balance of that. Because you have things like the mana dice and the fact that you're drawing cards from your deck that are giving you luck, but then you're having your strategy, the fact that you can use these cards that you draw as anything. Okay, you'll only get one point of anything, but it can be anything. That means no matter what cards you get, if you have a strategy in mind, you can still try and do it. So that works fantastically for meaning that there is so much choice. Each one of these cards represents so many different options and then when you've got five of them or even later in the game six in your hand and you're trying to decide how to use those cards which to use the more powerful which to use less powerfully it is beautiful for those choices because there is so many different combinations and of course when you've got a deck of cards the different cards that you're going to have in each hand means that each turn you've got a different puzzle that you're presented with of right, well, this is what I need to do. And because you're exploring a board, even if you end up with a hand of the same cards, you might be in a different place on the board trying to do a different thing. It is absolutely superb for that. But what helps kind of mitigate the luck factor, as well as the fact that you can use these cards for so many different things, is that you're building your deck as you proceed. Okay, it's not going to counteract the starting cards necessarily, but you could probably get an extra 50% of your cards in there. So one third of your deck over the course of a game could easily be constructed by you. And that can be a 
big difference. So it really does have a deck building aspect with when you level up, getting advanced cards, choosing to go after things that will give you artifacts rather than um, advanced actions, things that will give you spells. You can go, right, well, I want spells, so I'm going to go after the Mage Towers, for example. So many choices. It is fantastic. Um, so, as I say, the way all these mechanisms work together does give you so much choice, but it does make for a long game. Now, one thing I haven't talked about mechanically is these tokens. I think these work fine. They give an element of randomness and means that you can reveal them on the board, but know they're there. <sighs> Neither kind of here nor there. That what really makes this game is the mechanics of the deck building and the multiple uses of cards. So that is everything I want to say about mechanics. So as you can tell, I do really love this game. Now, one final thing, of course, I need to cover is can two play that game? Two can play that game. In fact, I recommend you, that you only play this with one or two people. As I've said, it is a long game. And the more people you introduce, the longer that game gets. Now, with one person, you're always engaged, you're always thinking, because it's always your turn, so it works wonderfully. This is the best, most engaging solo play game I have ever encountered. Now, again, even solo playing, it takes a couple of hours to play a game, so it is a long game for a solo play game, which is why it still doesn't get played as much as I would like. Now, with two players, it pretty much doubles that because the majority of the playtime isn't spent actually doing things. No, it's spent making decisions, trying to decide what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. And every time you add a player, you add more of that. Now, with two people, it works OK because you're, when it's not your turn, not a lot is going to change and you're still looking at your cards, deciding how you're going to use them. You're doing your thinking ahead of time, at least as much as you can until that slight change happens from what the other player has done. When you start adding more players, you increase that time dramatically and it makes it harder to plan ahead of your turn what you're going to do because so much is changing on each person's turn that you have a very different situation by the time your turn comes around, compared to when it ended. So, as I say, I'd recommend this for one or two players. Also, this is definitely not a game for people just getting into gaming. If you're after a simple game to play with younger children, I also would not recommend this. You could probably sort of, I don't know, teenage children maybe start introducing this to if you've had them playing other games i would say it is hugely complex and hugely enjoyable if you are interested in epic in-depth engaging games where you're making tons of decisions that always matter then you should really check this game out thanks for watching i do hope that you've enjoyed this video of course if you have enjoyed it Please do check out the rest of the videos on the channel, subscribe to the channel and share it with your fan, friends and family. And also do check us out on social media. We're on Facebook and also on Twitter. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.